Stranger, what I say is short. When was the last time you visited a graveyard? If you're anything like me, it's probably been a while. We moderns have done a great job of insulating ourselves from the dying process, from dying people, and even from the dignified, but admittedly often formulaic, markers we permit to acknowledge our dead. In the modern West, dying is, thanks to unprecedented technological advances and profits, largely conducted in hospitals, hospices, or nursing homes. The mortality itself obviously hasn't gone anywhere. Never has a civilization been more divorced from the realities of that good end to which we all must surely someday come. Not so the ancient Romans. 2,000 years ago, the dead could be said to have just as much of an impact on the city as the living. The respect and reverence that Romans showed toward the deceased illuminate the Romans' radically different attitude towards death, and illustrate why they would have been utterly perplexed by the deep-seated fear that many moderns show towards graveyards. Graves didn't give the ancient Roman goosebumps. Instead, they were much more likely to have inspired awe and reverence. Roman funerary monuments can still have that effect today, as many of the messages inscribed on these slabs of stone have survived, and they present a stunning portrait of the Romans in all of their complexity. The enduring nature of the stone inscriptions makes them our best source on the great mass of Romans who made up the bulk of the city's population, those who actually did the work and fought the wars. By shining a light on all rungs of society and the beliefs that animated them, the graves bring Rome to life. For those interested in exploring daily life in the city, the best place to start is not with the supposed great men who populate our histories, but with the dead. Though death will eventually come for each and every one of us, and will intervene throughout our lives to snatch away those we hold dear, modern society is organized in such a way as to sequester the majority of us from the trauma of death to a degree that would have been inconceivable to the ancient Roman. There, the ever-present specters of war, disease, and famine meant that the city was constantly haunted by death. The Romans knew that it could come for any one at any time, and could strike without warning, even in the houses of the most wealthy and well-insulated. Even during plentiful times, Romans would have experienced the deaths of friends and family on a frequent basis, and likely would not have gotten out of childhood without watching at least one sibling die, often for reasons that remained inexplicable to them. It is important to emphasize here that these deaths would typically occur in the home, surrounded by loved ones, instead of in an isolated hospital ward. The ensuing funerals were also public affairs, with families marching corpses through the streets accompanied by professional wailers and expressions of extreme grief, such as the ripping out of hair and the tearing of clothing. The wealthier the family, the more extravagant the mourning, and the more of a spectacle was made of the funeral. The most elaborate would even include funerary games, and these lavish games in honor of the dead were the origin of the gladiator fights that would become the national pastime of Rome. Even the Romans, who were fortunate enough to encounter death rarely, would have seen these funerals on a daily basis in the crowded city, creating a familiarity with death and a profound appreciation for the precariousness of life. Sources indicate that the famous phrase, memento mori, remember that you will die, was not in common use among the Romans, it is thought to have been popularized by the early Christian church, but the idea it contained was, nevertheless, central to Greek philosophy that increasingly informed the Roman understanding of existence. In their writings, separated by more than a hundred years, both Seneca and Marcus Aurelius return often to the pitiless truth that for good and for bad, all things move toward their end. This recognition of the brief and fleeting nature of life is the prevailing sentiment echoed on the inscriptions of Roman headstones, graves, and tombs. The enduring nature of these monuments makes them a valuable resource for historians, as they represent the dominant surviving primary source for writings from the lower classes. After all, stone lasts much longer than papyrus, and while only a select few elite Romans were ever able to write books, everyone needed to be buried eventually. The wealth and variety of these surviving inscriptions do more to bring the ancient world to life 
in all of its complexity than all the monologues of the great men recorded by Plutarch. If you want to familiarize yourself with the values and aspirations of the people who populated ancient Rome, then this is, unfortunately, the only place left where they speak for themselves. Here, and only here, do we have lower and middle class Romans speaking about themselves and their concerns. But unlike the terse statements on modern headstones, the Romans were quite verbose. These inscriptions tend to be quite lengthy, as Romans embraced what they knew would be their final chance to relay their lives, achievements, loves, and dreams to future generations. These inscriptions were a last gasp for immortality. And remarkably, some of them have been successful in that effort. There are thousands of surviving inscriptions that are still legible today, ranging from boasts of offices held and proud ancestral achievements, to heartfelt declarations of love, pain, longing, and loss by loved ones of the deceased. I find that the most touching of these is an epitaph for a woman named Claudia, about whom we know nothing else. Stranger, what I say is short. Stand and read over it. This is the hardly beautiful tomb of a beautiful woman. Her parents called her Claudia. She loved her husband with all her heart. She had two sons, one of whom she leaves on earth, the other she placed under it. With pleasant conversing but respectable gait, she cared for her home and made wool. I've spoken. Move along. There is something so moving to me about a husband begging the passerby for a moment of their attention so that he can share his love for her with them. It seems that many other headstones must have been present in the vicinity, and he felt the need to distinguish his wife's by speaking directly to the strangers passing by her final resting place. I get the feeling he was a doting man who would never miss an opportunity to praise his wife's character. More than 2,000 years later, he still speaks lovingly of her struggles and her virtue. Another inscription paints a portrait of Roman married life among the lower classes that is more illustrative of how the average Roman lived than 1,000 pages of Pliny. To the spirits of the dead and the eternal memory of Blandinia Martiola, a most innocent girl who lived 18 years, 9 months, 5 days. Pompeius Catusa, a Sequani citizen and plasterer, made this for his incomparable and most kind wife, who lived with me 5 years, 6 months, 18 days, without any transgressions. While alive, he saw to the building and dedicated this, while under construction, to himself and his wife. You who read this, go and bathe in the bath of Apollo, which I did with my wife. I wish I were still able to do it. But not all headstones are evocative portraits of family life. Some provide commentaries on the deceased's philosophical or religious views. During the heyday of Epicurean philosophy, many headstones featured the blithe inscription, I was not. I was. I am not. I care not. You could be forgiven for wondering how little someone actually cared if they were willing to go through the trouble of commissioning a headstone, but the emerging popularity of the Epicurean school in Rome during the 3rd century BC and its agnostic approach to the afterlife represented a remarkable shift from the prevailing morals and religious precepts that had guided the Roman state since its inception. But Epicurean ideals never quite caught on, and after peaking during the late Republic, they rapidly declined under the rule of Augustus. Epicureanism was likely always a fringe movement on the Italian peninsula, because to be Roman was to be shaped as much by the dead as by the living, if not more so. While the tombs and graves of the poor were devoted to the memory of the person interred within, aristocrats made use of their tombs to increase the prominence of their families, as the competition for honor never stopped, even in death. Because burials were only allowed inside the city when approved by senatorial decree, the competition among Rome's upper classes to build ever more ornate and elaborate tombs generally took place along the Appian Way and at other prominent locations just outside the city. Those walking Rome's most famous road today can still see the remains of massive tombs that were designed to capture the attention of passers-by and fill them with a sense of wonder. Many of these tombs survive in excellent condition, such as the tomb of Caecilia Metella, who was the wife of one of Crassus's sons. This magnificent mausoleum was so grand and so enduring 
that it was turned into a castle in the 14th century by Pope Boniface VIII. But of all aristocrats, the most enduring epitaph belongs to the reactionary warlord and dictator Sulla, a man himself responsible for sending many Romans to early graves. While Augustus's epitaph is over 35 paragraphs long, Sulla apparently believed in brevity, and simply left the inscription, No friend ever served me, and no enemy ever wronged me, whom I have not repaid in full. For posterity to remember him by. One reason that clusters of graves or other funerary monuments were never viewed as intrinsically creepy places by the Romans is that the cities of the dead were constantly filled with the living. Descendants had a duty to honor the tombs of their forebears by regularly cleaning them and making offerings to the manes, spirits of the departed that were believed to inhabit burial sites. Instead of the desolate, lonely graveyards that exist today, a Roman necropolis would have been teeming with activity throughout the year, but especially during festivals such as the Parentalia. When imagining the tombs that line the Appian Way, we must not picture them in austere gray stone, but as vividly, even garishly, painted, and constantly adorned with garlands of flowers and other offerings. This habit of leaving flowers at grave sites has remained with us down to the present, another legacy of Rome that we take for granted. And while today these Roman graves have gone undecorated for thousands of years, there is one notable exception. In the middle of the Roman Forum sits the Temple of the Divine Julius, built on the spot of Caesar's funeral pyre to honor the man who did more than any other patrician to earn the love of Rome's common people. Though Caesar's ashes no longer rest here, you can still find flowers and coins at the foundation of the temple, over 2,000 years after Caesar's death. But in a satisfying irony of history, it is the monuments of the common people, not Rome's most eminent, that have been best preserved, and now you can find hundreds of headstones and sarcophaguses in the Capitoline Museums on the hill overlooking the Forum. These preserve the tales of Romans from every walk of life, throughout the entire span of Roman history. It's fitting that the monuments of those who actually built Rome are now stored on the Capitoline Hill itself, in the place of highest honor that a Roman could ever conceive of. If you had told these souls, these workaday Romans, that thousands of years later, millions of people, people strangely dressed, people young and old, people from places for which the Romans didn't even have names, would come to read their funerary inscriptions, or wonder at the workmanship of their sarcophagus, they would never have believed you. But death, like life, sometimes seems to possess a kind of wit. Wealth and power are no sure path to virtue or happiness in life, and they are no guarantee of reverence, or even remembrance, in death. I have spoken. Move along. Hi, this is Titus from Tribunet. If you enjoyed the video you just saw by Gaius, and if you're interested in thoughtful content that explores the complex culture of the ancient Romans, don't forget to hit like and subscribe.